I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and my guests today are James Rosenquist and Leo Castelli. Mr. Rosenquist's paintings have been a major influence on the iconography of this period. They are worked in a billboard style of magazine and advertisement images of American life. Mr. Castelli, who is the newly elected president of the Art Dealers but, Association. Not quite yet, I must correct there. I'm going to become, I've been des I'm only president designate. Of the Art Dealers <laughs> Association of America is Mr. Rosenquist's dealer as well. And I guess he is <laughs> perhaps. Which is a more glorious occupation. <laughs> which gives further evidence why he is not only the best known, but easily the most charismatic of dealers of contemporary art. A warm welcome to you, James Rosenquist and Leo Castelli. Mr. Rosenquist comes to New York, came to New York from North Dakota and Minnesota in the 1950s. You were, for several years, soon after you came, painting signs above Times Square, or at least that's the way the myth goes. How did that come to pass? I walked into a sign painting company in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and said I could do all of that. I was, I think I was 17 years old. And they said to me, um, we can always use a good man here. And uh, they, said, they said, try painting those two <coughs> heads of I think, two, two young people drinking Coca-Cola. So I started painting it, and uh, at the end of the day, I worked very hard at it, and at the end of the day he said, you haven't got the swing, kid. Uh, too bad. So I left that, and uh, I uh, got another job painting uh, signs on gasoline stations through the Midwest. And a short time after that, uh, I went back to the same man, the same company, and I said, I can do that. And what they were painting then currently was about a 60-foot uh, plate of Kraft macaroni salad. <laughs> and also, well, very large, large images. I said, I can do that. And they said, well, we don't let people do that till they've been here 25 years. I said, well, I can do that. So uh, I had another tryout, and I could do it. And they hired me. And uh, uh, right uh, short, that was in 1950, about the beginning of 1955, uh, then I applied for an out-of-town scholarship to the Art Students League in Manhattan, and uh, I think I arrived here with $300 in my pocket and uh, a chance to go to the Art Students League. Um, I did that for a year, and after that I uh, attempted to join the Sign Painters un Union in Manhattan, and uh, I don't know if it was grudgingly, but uh, they, they let me, they are very nice, uh, but I got into the union, and uh, my first sign in New York was a Hebrew national salami sign on <laughs> Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. Slowly, I, uh, I, had a, I, I worked in many, many, this is very slowly, I worked many locations all around Brooklyn and Bronx, uh, Long Island City, and then I had an opportunity to work in the, on the biggest signs, and that was uh, in Times Square. Uh, I painted, uh, oh my goodness, I painted, um, at one time I was painting a boy and his dog 60 feet long and then a man tan, sun tan lotion sign on the uh, Castro convertible sign and jo a picture of Joanne Woodward at the same time. And the UPS came along and said, what are you doing there? What is, what's going on? And I, and I said, oh, this is a, snake oil advertisement. Uh, I'm really an artist and I do miniature paintings. <laughs> so they wrote a story about a they billboard. They billboard Michelangelo, uh, yeah, yes. A billboard Michelangelo who really paints miniatures. <laughs> and uh, the reason I started, became, well, became interested in sign painting was I thought, I sort of thought it was a, the lost school of mural painting. I tried to learn uh, how to paint a mural in various schools, and I couldn't find out very little. I could find out very little from anyone. And so <clears throat> from these, these men uh, had all the technique, craft, incredible, uh, uh, and they also had, they had incredible ability to do what, what, they, what they did. So, and at that time, when I was painting, I'd travel 
around Manhattan uh, and all over the boroughs. And at that time, I began to meet artists uh, in Manhattan. Uh, and as probably some of you know, the, <clears throat> the and Leo maybe should start talking about that, the situation of the art gallery and the life of an artist was so, so different uh, then than it is oh, 10 years ago or it is now. Artists that, <coughs> that I knew about and respected, like uh, I used to see Franz Klein in the Cedar Bar and I met de Kooning, who I know. Uh, ne I never met Jackson Pollock. I met Stuart he Davis. Died, he died in 56. He died yeah, in 56. I met Stuart Davis and oh, a number of artists, Mose, Moses Sawyer, I believe. Uh, Was your work in that abstract expressionist mold at that time? No, no. Uh, um, so <clears throat> uh, I, I saw, would see them walking around seemingly not doing very well financially. And, uh, and the younger artists that I knew, like uh, oh, Bob Rauschenberg, Jack Youngerman, Bob Indiana, the, they, Ellsworth Kelly, yeah. Uh, we, it was sort of hopeless to see these giants or men of, from the WPA or the abstract expressionist artists who didn't seem to be doing very well. And if they didn't seem to be doing very well, like uh, what, could, what could happen to us? <coughs> Slowly, uh, well, Leo, things began to change. Well, Leo, how did work first come to your attention? Uh, well, at one point after I had shown Jasper Jones and Rauschenberg in 59 for the first time, uh, and then uh, a little later, uh, actually at the same time in 59, I had uh, sort of uh, got to know Rauschenberg much earlier and John's uh, in 57, uh, I showed them in, 15, in 58 actually, Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg, I had those two first exhibitions at my gallery. Uh, Rauschenberg actually had already had several exhibitions at uh, the stable and at uh, Charlie Egan's. First Charlie Egan and then Stephen, and Pity Parsons even once. He had been already in three galleries without getting any recognition whatsoever. Uh, he just uh, didn't even make $50 <laughs> from those shows. Uh, so then uh, in 59 I, I found Stella and he together with Johns and Rauschenberg <coughs> had a show at uh, MoMA, uh, one of those 14 or 16 American shows that you I uh, probably have heard about. Uh, so that was in 59. Then in 1961, a new group of people sort of uh, suddenly emerged out of nowhere. And the first uh, one of those that I saw, I think, I think uh, I'm correct right. in saying that, was Liechtenstein, right, because Liechtenstein didn't wait for me to come to see what he was doing in his studio, but came to the gallery with uh, some paintings under his arm. Uh, I uh, liked them very much. I didn't know what to do with them, but I thought that they were very good. They were based, as you all know now, on comic strips. And I was then, by then, already knew, uh, used to think extravagant things. Also, not only because I had uh, shown the, the flags, uh, targets, and uh, numbers of Jasper Johns, and all those uh, uh, junky paintings, as uh, they were uh, at that time uh, called, of Rauschenbergs. Uh, I was used to everything. But that was also a tradition in my case, because I had been familiar with the Dada, and the surrealist, especially with the Dada movement, and one of the great uh, 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 practitioners, uh, uh, Marcel Duchamp. So everything seemed possible to me. So if a guy came along with uh, uh, paintings that were based on, on comic strips, uh, it was no surprise to me. I, I found it entirely acceptable. People pointed out to me there are other things of this type going on. Uh, so I went down to his studio at Quentislip, and I went to see uh, Andy Warhol, 
up on Lexington Avenue, and I saw Oldenburg. Oldenburg was more visible. He had started just slightly earlier, and I think that store of his uh, occurred in '61. Yeah. Right. There were also the happenings that occurred at the same time. There was more visibility there in the case of Oldenburg. But you weren't inviting people to your studio. No, I, I had a pe peculiar situation. I never invited anybody. And people would ring up and say, can I see your work? And was, I felt very egotistical. It was <laughs> incredible. Did you or do you think of yourself as a pop artist? I thought, why couldn't I make a picture that used fragments of of real imagery and paint them uh, as mag paint them magnified and s put them in the picture plane in different in at different distances so that uh, one fragment would be recognized easier sooner or later than the other fragment and then the last the last thing would be so magnified and so close that it really would be the most mysterious of all the, the fragments. And it, would, it could be like someone, uh, like if the person was very cold and uh, someone was offering a fur coat in an alley and you, and you were freezing and you wanted to put your arm in that coat but uh, you didn't know who was standing behind it. And I wanted that kind of a thing to, 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 to be very blunt and be very powerful but also be, try to be mysterious. Um, Is the it, it was like, it, from from my bringing up uh, through the you know the radio commercials of the 50s and the beginnings of television and all that n the noise with signboards and everything I felt numb. So the numbness that I was living in from my childhood, I th I thought I could work in that area. I thought I could do something <coughs> with it. One of your best known and certainly most controversial works not only has a past but seems to have a recurring present. I'm thinking of F-111, that 85 foot long, was it 10 feet high? Mm -hmm. Is it 10 feet high painting? Mm -hmm. That uh, most recently, uh, one was most recently reminded of when the B-1 bomber program was finally put to rest. Mm -hmm. But in the final analysis, is that painting that was done in 1965 about warfare, about the condition of artists, or about some other personal concern of yours? Well, uh, when I began painting that, I had just studied Eastern philosophy in Aspen, Colorado, and I was told that income taxes were invented by the Chinese, and that was to begin a community, uh, a contribution, contributions from people to begin a community, to begin a society. You were supposed to con contribute to do that. And then I saw myself living, uh, I, I met Paul Berg from the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. He had just come back from Vietnam and did a <coughs> report uh, for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch about, uh, about the war. Uh, I thought uh, what it was like for a, per a person or an artist to live, live now in this society. And uh, I had a, the strange, well, I also saw a huge obsolete bomber in Texas. And a number of things um, started you know, getting up off the chair to make sketches and ideas about doing this painting that I did or whatever. But any, anyway, uh, uh, I thought what a joke it would be if I made a, a painting of something, a war tool or image that someone, that people had already paid for with their taxes. That, that already had done it. So it really would be crazy if, if uh, a person or persons uh, who already had done that would be made to, to buy a, uh, a picture of something that they'd already bought, and, I mean already, already been made to buy. So, uh, and I never expected that. It was like a big joke. It's like my life was, it felt like a joke. So um, I did it and uh, showed it. And at the end of the show, Leo came into the gallery and he said, guess what? Bob Skull is in the back room and he wants to buy the whole painting. And I almost You expected people to buy a portion, chair. sort of to take a souvenir yes. of a panels. Yeah. A souvenir, so to speak, of yeah. F-111. It was in 51 panels. Did you study art and were you influenced in any way by art when you were in Minnesota? Well, at, in 1948, I won a 
small scholarship to go to art school for four days. <laughs> and, uh, Very small scholarship. Yeah. And I was given the best tools, the best piece of paper, the best kind of paper, the best pencil. And uh, the art teachers at that time had just returned from Paris after they had been war veterans. They stayed in Paris on their GI Bill to study art. And uh, they were talking about non-objective art, and I had no idea what that was. And they were also talking, someone was talking about an artist who dripped paint out of cans. And that was Jackson Pollock. And, uh, and uh, that was a long way from, those influences were a long way from the Midwest. What was the painterly tradition that you were <coughs> working against? Uh, I wanted to be able to paint things that looked uh, like photographic fragments that, that looked like I hadn't really uh, touched the, can the canvas. Do you use photographic images in any of your work, Jim? Yes, I use, uh, I make collages out of, from photographic images and I, I paint, paint from them but I, uh, I rarely use, a, I've used silk screens too but I rarely do that. Your realistic images are obviously vehicles for conveying some kind of new visual information. What are your own primary tools, your own primary conceptual tools? During the Vietnam War, uh, the atmosphere was terrible. And uh, so what happens, and it happened in my work, polit political references have come in, uh, and I didn't take the time to throw them out. And that's why they occurred in, the, in my paintings. Uh, it's like working to throw out bad feelings. I, I remember I was uh, in 1968, I had a brand new studio and I was making a new painting called Horse Blinders, which meant going straight ahead. And then the <clears throat> assassinations began to occur. And then I began to feel like I had a ball and chain around my ankle. I, my things changed and my, the whole painting changed. Leo, to what extent does your own aesthetic judgment influence the artists whose work you represent? I never try to influence uh, the painters uh, who are affiliated with my gallery in any possible way, telling them to, go to paint the small paintings because they are more sellable. He certainly, in that uh, respect, is the greatest sinner of them all. And there were no market uh, considerations. <laughs> there's no one who painted painting as large as his. Actually, uh, my gallery uptown uh, seemed to be the arena where he <laughs> he really uh, went to town and uh, painted uh, uh, all the walls, uh, like in F-111, and then... He had to wrap around. He ra well, F-111, you say that it's an 84-foot uh, painting, but that's just accidental. <laughs> it's uh, wrapped around the gallery, and the gallery happened to, happens to have 84 feet yes. of uh, wall space. And then I covered the floor with the dry ice. There. And then uh, at that <coughs> point, he was not even satisfied with doing uh, the walls. He also did, uh, did the floor. <laughs> <laughs> of course, those paintings uh, seem to be hardly sellable, but they did sell uh, nevertheless, because there are some imaginative collectors, thank God, very few of them, who do really uh, buy uh, those things. Uh, God knows why, but they do. <laughs> and uh, one of them uh, used to be Skull, whose uh, ambitions uh, were, collecting ambitions were boundless, and he's greatly to be admired for that. It's a pity that, uh, well, as everything, uh, his uh, beginning, a middle, and an end, he, he wore out, uh, well, through various circumstances of his life. But another one who had the same um, uh, gigantic approach to collecting and still is very active is Dr. Ludwig in, in Cologne in Germany who bought the other 84 foot painting called Horse Blinders that he just mentioned. Then he simmered down a little bit, he just uh, uh, made paintings that were merely occupied uh, the long walls of the gallery, just uh, 24 foot or so each. My uh, association and affiliation <laughs> with Leo has been that he provides uh, a spirit and a help, and he's very, Leo's very generous. And uh, I find out how generous he is when I, as I meet more and more people who newly become involved in art and interested in art. So uh, <clears throat> my life has been like a roller coaster, up and down and down and up. And during the terrible times, he's <clears throat> been, been uh, very, very helpful. 
And uh, I, that's, that's what I think. That's been his aesthetic experience on me. Who are the great collectors now, Leo? Well, the very, very few of, uh, uh, of the great uh, collectors uh, remain. Some uh, have faded, like uh, Skull. Uh, others are still alive and kicking, like uh, uh, Dr. Ludwig. And uh, his capacity of buying paintings seems to be limitless. Mm -hmm. He's filled uh, museums uh, all over the world, apart from his own museum in Cologne. There'll be a new building because uh, he has burst uh, the bounds of, uh, of the existing building. He uh, has on paintings on loan all over uh, at the museum in Basel, in, in Vienna, in East uh, Berlin. Uh, in Tehran, he had a show now uh, of his uh, mm. selection of his works. The other great collector, very strange, uh, idiosyncratic uh, uh, man, is an Italian, Count uh, Panza, who uh, was even more curious than, uh, than, than Ludwig in his uh, collecting. He has a palace uh, in a place called Varese near Milan, beautiful uh, 18th, early 18th century palace. And he just uh, transforms his stables in, in, in art galleries. After exhausting the space that, they had, that he had in the palace itself, he started using the stables, the attic, everything. <laughs> and he has absolutely gigantic uh, uh, works there by, uh, say, Nauman or Sarah or Morris or uh, uh, Wells. <coughs> But uh, up to the most recent manifestations of uh, uh, conceptual art, he has many paintings uh, of uh, Rosenquist's stew that he bought in the early period. Yeah. Yeah, so these that? are the two giants. Uh, there are others, of course, very good collections, but there are not many. Great collectors are as rare as, uh, as great painters uh, or great anything. <laughs> what is a businessman from Trieste with a marked interest in philosophy and history? end up to be just about the greatest salesman, tastemaker of art since the days of Duveen. How did that ever happen to you? Oh, to me? Yes. <laughs> I thought you were still talking about Ludwig. <laughs> How did it happen? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Just uh, accidentally, I would say. From one thing to the other. <laughs> no, there was that ambition that I always uh, had to understand what uh, art history was about in the past, and then also trying to find out what uh, it was in the present, and also what I could uh, uh, imagine that it would be in the future. It was that idea. Actually, my enterprise uh, in the beginning, when I started uh, the gallery back in 57, was just a search for uh, new, important, artists, but especially not artists as individuals so much, but also exploring trends that they belong to, where they came from, what their influences were on them, where a Jasper Johns or a Rauschberg, to begin with, or a Twombly, came out from. Did you ever uh, expect the press to proclaim the pictorial events of the pop art movement the way it did? It was helpful uh, in a certain way to call attention with, uh, to, to the movement, but uh, uh, I don't think that uh, they really uh, understood what they were talking about, frankly. But they called attention to it. And so they permitted this uh, movement really to thrive. There were a few intelligent people who really knew what it was about. And uh, the press really, for the wrong reasons, was uh, very supportive. In the long sweep of history, how do you both feel the pop art movement will be evaluated? What about you? It seems that every new generation thinks wh whatever the press, well, whatever the press has said about in reviews about something that hap happened, the next generation of artists usually uh, has a quite a different take on it and quite, a, quite, it redoes, it sort of rethinks it and th thinks of it quite differently. So I think the the ideas about something that's called a movement uh, aren't, uh, it's not stationary. I think it, it, it changes. I think each generation reevaluates it and so then it becomes <clears throat> more or less important as time goes, goes by. So um, I think it's very healthy 
too. Thank you, Jim Rosenquist. Thank you, Leo Castelli. And special thanks to you for being with us, too.